Hey everybody and uh, welcome back to Submarine History. Today, in briefing number 48, we're continuing our crawl along the torpedo history timeline with our focus today on the Whitehead torpedo, which, like John P. Holland's Holland 6 submarine, was truly transformative for the development of the submarine as an effective lethal weapons platform worldwide. In briefing number 47, uh, which was the first in this installment on torpedoes, the torpedoes we talked about actually weren't torpedoes. They were floating sea mines that, with some exceptions, were unguided and unpredictable weapons. In this briefing, we're going to talk about the early weapons we think of when you hear the word torpedo. Read the description to this briefing. It has relevant uh, related references and links. I have a Discord as well, and there's an invitation link on the channel banner. If you like the briefing, you can leave a super thanks or consider a channel membership. Your donation helps off at, offset the cost of purchasing books, professional memberships, and software needed to write and record the briefings you've come to enjoy and appreciate. Finally, thank you to the United States Naval Institute for all they do preserving and promoting world naval history. If you have any questions about the briefing, leave them in the comment section below, and I'll do my best to answer them. In the U.S., uh, the culmination of Robert Fulton's work on sea mines was the Spar Torpedo. Fulton had proposed the idea of this pole-mounted mine, attached to the bow of a ship to the U.S. Navy as early as 1813. Likely with uh, Fulton's death in 1815, momentum for the project faltered, and it would be another 50 years before the concept was brought to fruition. This is the CSS David. Uh, this was a semi-submersible uh, surface ship that, when properly ballasted, only showed its low-profile conning tower and boiler smokestack. So this is something reminiscent of the VLP, or very low-profile narco boats that drug cartels use today to move drugs from Central and South America to the USA. It's, uh, it's interesting that uh, anthracite coal was used as a fuel. Uh, apparently, it didn't generate smoke when burned. So at night, this would have been a very difficult object uh, to spot in the water. And you can clearly see the spar-mounted torpedo at the bow. Uh, the torpedo itself was about three feet long, uh, with a diameter just under a foot and packed with 134 pounds of gunpowder. This is the USS New Ironsides, um, and, and we're talking for, you know, Europeans and stuff, or people not in the U.S. Um, you know, we're talking, this, we're talking about the U.S. Uh, Confederate, uh, Civil War, excuse me. So this is like 1860 to 1865. Um, so this was one of three early armored steamship prototypes built in response to the news that the Confederates were building the ironclad CSS Virginia. Uh, and by the way, USS Monitor was another one of the prototypes that was built. Uh, and now this ship, USS New, uh, New Ironsides, uh, this ship had a waterline belt of wrought iron for protection. And this is the night of October 5th, 1863, when David attacked New Ironsides, successfully detonating its spar torpedo against New Ironsides' hull, damaging but not sinking it. And by the way, we have the H.L. Hunley in February 1864 sinking the USS Housatonic, the first ship sunk by a submarine. I'm not going to cover Hunley uh, in this briefing as I did a three-part briefing series on it already, but I'll put links to those briefings in the description uh, for this one. Meanwhile, on the other side of the Atlantic, uh, we have Giovanni de Lupis, a retired officer of the Austrian Navy. Around 1860, he was shown papers by an officer in the Austrian Marine Artillery, which described an exploding boat that could be brought into contact with an enemy ship. De Lupus thought this was a great idea, and he spent several years developing and building a prototype he called the Kustenbrander, meaning coastal fire ship. Now, we talked about fire ships in briefing number 47. In that briefing, the fire ship example we talked about was the 1584-1585 siege of Antwerp by the Spanish. In that example, the Dutch tried sailing a couple of ships packed with gunpowder into a bridge built across the uh, Scheldt River by the Spanish to block Dutch access to the sea. One ship ran aground and the other did make contact with the bridge and damaged it, but not enough to break the blockade. That's not the only example of the use of fire ships in combat. On the night of August 7th, 1588, the British sailed fire ships into the Spanish Armada off Calais. Those fire ships scattered the Spanish, playing a role in their defeat by the British at the Battle of Gravelines, and ultimately the abandonment of the planned invasion of England. And here it is, de Lupus's uh, Kustenbrander, or coastal fire ship. Uh, this was a working scale model prototype. This was a surface-running torpedo powered by a clockwork motor. 
It was a pack with an explosive payload that was triggered by a percussion pistol uh, when hitting a target ship at the waterline. And the torpedo was steered from shore using long tiller ropes. There's some real progress here in uh, torpedo development. Uh, it was self-propelled and it could be guided remotely, you know, from shore through the tiller ropes. It had a percussion cap type exploder, which was more reliable than a flintlock mechanism, mechanism with a gunpowder pan that could easily be, be easily upset. De Lupus offered his design to naval officers in Vienna. The officials, uh, they felt the design had potential, but it needed to be developed further. So De Lupus was put in touch with the premier established naval engineer working in the Austrian Empire, Robert Whitehead, an English engineer who managed a metal foundry in the city of Fiume on the Adriatic Sea. And today that is uh, Rijeka, Croatia. Hopefully I pronounced that right. If I didn't, I apologize. Whitehead, uh, he was intrigued by the idea of Delupus's coastal fire ship, and they formed a partnership to develop the prototype. Whitehead spent a lot of time trying to improve the power output of the torpedo and tried to simplify its steering system. But he just couldn't address the two fundamental problems of the coastal fire ship. The first problem um, is that it was a slow surface running weapon, so slow that a ship's crew could spot it with enough time to counter it either by firing at it, maneuvering out of the way, or just simply knocking it aside since it lacked power. The second problem was that it had a short range of action because of the clockwork motor spring and the fact it had to be steered from shore. The more he thought about it, uh, the more Whitehead realized that you needed, to, you needed the weapon to be invisible. If it was invisible, you could address other deficiencies, like a lack of powder from a spring. Say use a pressurized air flask to drive the propeller. But that wasn't going to work if the torpedo ran on the surface and it could be spotted. It needed to run underwater. If he could make the torpedo hold a preset course in depth so it wouldn't be spotted and could hit a ship where it was most vulnerable, then he really had something. Something much safer for the crew to use as opposed to the spar torpedoes he knew was being used in the American Civil War. So he threw himself at the project and came up with solutions to the problems he understood. Compressed air for the power plant a calibrated rudder for maintaining a course, okay, that was your horizontal control, and a hydrostatic valve and pendulum system for maintaining a preset depth, your, vertic your vertical control. The hydrostatic valve and pendulum system was really the secret sauce uh, because it made it possible to limit depth variations to a few inches, which was critical. There are no photos of the original prototype torpedo Whitehead produced in 1866, but we do have drawings of some of his very early prototypes, and this is one of them. The 1866 prototype torpedo was made from steel sheets with a length of 11 feet and a 14-inch diameter. The two-bladed propeller was powered by a two-cylinder compressed air engine that utilized a pressure regulator to maintain a constant speed of 6.5 knots over 200 yards and then another 100 yards at a slower speed. The 17.6 pound gunpowder, gunpowder charge was detonated by a percussion cap exploder. In 1872, Whitehead purchased the metal foundry he had been managing and repurposed it to produce his torpedoes. Uh, and again, at the time, it was the city of Fiume, but today it's uh, Rijeka, Croatia, right there in the Adriatic. Let's look at this timeline a moment. Um, I can't promise it's 100% accurate. I had to pull information from a lot of sources, but it should be close. So 1866, we get the first Whitehead prototype. 1868, uh, Whitehead demonstrates his prototype to the Austrian Navy, and they agree to purchase it, leaving Whitehead the right to market and sell the torpedo to other countries. In 1871, Whitehead licenses his torpedo design to the British. Part of that collaboration was an, was an agreement to share technolo technological improvements back and forth between the British and Whitehead. In 1872, Whitehead forms the Whitehead Torpedo Works. 1873, German industrialist uh, Louis Schwarzkopf visits the Whitehead Torpedo Works, quote, obtaining a set of design drawings, and a year later he begins making a knockoff of the Whitehead Torpedo, the Schwarzkopf Torpedo. And this will take the Germans down their own path of torpedo development. In 1876, the contra-rotating prop is introduced. This is a major improvement, eliminating the tendency of a torpedo body to rotate or roll from the unbalanced torque of a single, single prop. 
Um, and I think that improvement was made by the British and it was shared back with Whitehead. In 1883, the semi-rounded nose is introduced, giving the Whitehead torpedo that modern look we kind of expect. In 1890, Whitehead moves to an 18-inch diameter torpedo body. Previously, he had been using 14 and 16-inch uh, bo uh, body diameters. And Whitehead also expands his production facilities into the UK and France. In 1895, the gyroscope is introduced for the purpose of maintaining a set course of travel. This improvement will also allow an operator to program in a course change so that after the torpedo has been fired and traveled a certain distance, it can make a course change and hold that new heading. In 1896, Whitehead licenses his torpedo design to the USA. Uh, 1900, Whitehead does a production run for a special order of 27.5 inch diameter torpedoes for the Japanese. 1904, uh, the USA forks off from the Whitehead torpedo timeline like the Germans, making their own version called the Bliss Levitt. In 1905, Whitehead does another special production run for the Japanese, this time a 24-inch diameter torp. Whitehead also dies this year, and his family sells the company to Vickers Armstrong's Whitworth. 1907, heating of the air flask is introduced, greatly improving speed and distance of his torpedoes. Um, and the idea is that hot air creates high pressure, which equals more power. In 1908, Whitehead introduces a 20-inch diameter torpedo. Now, when the United States started their own Bliss Levitt line of torpedoes in 1904, they went with a 24-inch, or excuse me, a 21-inch diameter body themselves. 1913, steam power is introduced as a power source. The steam would be generated by mixing uh, air from the air flask with a fuel supply, say alcohol, and then fresh water to create steam for two turbines which drove counter-rotating screws. And this greatly extends the range and speed of the torpedoes. Okay, finally, 1915. Uh, Vickers repurposes the Weymouth Torpedo Production Facility to focus on anti-submarine warfare as well as torpedo production. It's not entirely clear, but it appears the Whitehead Torpedo Production Facility in, uh, in Fium, which, had been, which was still owned by the Whitehead family, as I understand it, it becomes a Hungarian-owned subsidiary, the Hungarian Submarine Building Corporation, uh, or Untusibot uh, AG or UBAG. And they would begin building submarines for the Austria-Hungarian Navy. For the last six slides, uh, we're going to go over the components that make up a Whitehead Mark I, built by the U.S. under license, and the reference is a U.S. Navy technical manual published in 1898. This torpedo had an explosive charge of approximately 100 pounds and could run 600 yards at 30 knots or 750 yards at 29 knots. Here we have the warhead uh, that contains the uh, explosive and detonator, or exploder at its, as it's referred to. And this warhead could be changed out with an inert practice head for training. These next two slides are examples of exploders. Uh, this is an exploder for the German G7A torpedo from World War II. When the torpedo is fired, the impeller starts to spin, and after traveling a set distance, it arms the torpedo. And there are two ways this contact exploder can go off. You either have a head-on hit, which pushes the nose straight back into a firing pin, or you're a little off angle and one of those whiskers makes contact with the ship's hull, and that triggers the firing pin. So we're not quite there with magnetic exploders. Those will come a little later. And even though this is a World War II air exploder, it's the basic same design as was used for the White Hats. And uh, here's another example uh, of an exploder with uh, contact whiskers. The next section of the torpedo body is the air flask, uh, which is our power source. While we're looking at it, uh, note that the exploder looks a lot like that uh, G7A exploder two slides previous. The immersion chamber contains a hydrostatic valve uh, and pendulum that work to get together to keep the torpedo at a constant depth during its run. The pendulum was critical uh, as operation of the hydrostatic valve could cause the torpedo to change depth by several feet before re reaching the uh, set depth. The pendulum acted to dampen those drastic changes to a few inches. The afterbody includes a torpedo's steering and drivetrain. The gyroscope is here, and its purpose was to keep the torpedo on a constant course. The gyroscope could also be set so that, after the torpedo traveled a set distance, the gyroscope could manage a preset course change. This feature, along with the exploder whiskers, made it possible for our submarine to make those off-angled 
shots on target. And that's basically it for the for the torpedo. Uh, even though as as we you know get into World War One, that time between World War One and World War Two, and then World War Two itself, there are improvements and advances in, in tor- torpedo development. I mean, this is basically it. And finally, uh, the last known operational use of a Whitehead torpedo was during the Battle of Drobeck Sound on April 9, 1940. Two torpedoes were fired from a torpedo battery in the Oslo Fjord, which, along with gunfire from the Oskarborg Coastal Battery, sank the German cruiser uh, Blücher. And that's it for today's briefing. Um, I hope you enjoyed it. Leave your questions and comments below. And, uh, oh yeah, come to the Submarine History Discord and say hi. Till next time. Peace out.